Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Attract and Stand Out podcast. I'm your host, Darlene Holly, And oh my gosh, you are in for a treat. We are celebrating today. We're going to do some celebration. Where, where'd those cute little reactions go? Oh. We are recording the 100th episode of the Attract and Stand Out podcast. Woo! That is so exciting. I'm so happy I'm here. Yay! Thank you so much, Becky. I am thrilled that you're here with me celebrating today because a hundred episodes of the podcast is amazing. I don't know about you, but it's a lot of work putting these podcasts together. And I absolutely adore the hundred people I've had on my podcast that I've got to episode or I've got to interview on the episodes. And me and Becky are going to chat here in just a second and we're going to get to know Becky. But I love this community. I love the opportunity I get to have every single month coming into your podcast audio or showing up on YouTube and just being with my amazing community. So if you are here for the first time, welcome. There's 100 episodes to go back and listen to, or 99 plus this one. And if you've been here since the beginning, you've been listening to the podcast, I absolutely adore you. Thank you for going on this journey with me and just being a part of these conversations. Nothing connects us better than amazing conversations. My favorite thing to do is sit around on the couch or around a campfire or sit in the backyard at a barbecue and just chat and get to know people. And I'm so glad that we get to do this. So if you are brand new here, please subscribe. If you have been here listening to the podcast, leave a review. I would love 100 reviews for our 100th episode. That would be amazing. Please leave a review. Tell your friends, share the episode, and help um, get this conversation out there. But enough celebration. Just kidding. We're going to celebrate the whole entire episode. But Becky, I want to hear you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And how exciting. I love that I'm on the 100th. This is a big deal. A yeah, huge deal you. for you. That's a lot of work. Like, it is. all right, where's my reaction? I need to give you another clap because I all, am Let's impressed. do all the celebrating. Woo! Now I got to type and clap. It doesn't come up naturally. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Thank <laughs> you. It, it's, it's funny because, so I started this podcast in, I actually started recording at the end of 2019. I released in February, 2020 which was obviously, we all know those dates, they're near and dear to our heart because we all got to stay home and become um, couch potatoes. <laughs> we didn't leave our houses for a little while, but it was such an important part of that time for me, like getting a chance to have conversations and to connect with people. And so I'm so excited I get to continue connecting. Becky, tell us a little bit about you. Who the heck are you and what do you do? Let me tell you who the heck I am. So I am um, a little bit of everything. I started career-wise. I started as a broadcast journalist for 24 years, and that was um, a really hard business to break into. I loved every minute of it, but then I just got to a point that I didn't feel the challenge anymore. I didn't feel like, um, just didn't feel challenged. And that's a big thing for me. I always want to learn something new. I always want to be challenged with what's in front of me, and it just wasn't there anymore. So I thought, I'm going to make a move. And so I moved out of the broadcast journalism world and into research institutes. And from there, it just a bunch of different verticals um, in marketing and communication. And then last year was my big leap of faith. I went out on my own as an entrepreneur and founded my own chief um, fraction or my fractional chief marketing officer business. And uh, so I've been a, a fractional CMO for multiple, multiple clients. So say three to five clients at any given time, and I'm their CMO. And it's a great, it's a win-win for everyone. It's great for me because I love to do different things and not always do the same thing every day. And you, you definitely don't as a fractional CMO. And it's great for the um, businesses who maybe aren't big enough to bring on the heaviness of a, a full C-suite or, you know, for whatever reason, money or time. Um, this gives it a little bit of, I guess you could say a lightweight feel to it, but they still get the same results and the same, and the same uh, marketing strategy. So it's exciting. It's really cool. That's amazing. Congratulations on that beat. I know starting our own businesses and getting our name out there and kind of hanging up that shingle. Yes. Yeah. Can be all the sensations, all the feels, all the emotions <laughs> that come into that. What would you say was like one of the most um, exciting pieces of it for you? Like what piece did you really like gravitate to and love? Um, I love meeting new people and doing, I know that sounds really kind of dorky, but I do dig networking and like discovery calls. Um, you know, obviously as we not all know, every discovery call isn't going to convert into a client, but every discovery call, 
I learn like kind of back to the point of being challenged. I learn something new every time I find out what people's pain points are, because at the end of the day, all of us have a solution. We have clients who have problems and pain points. And as a marketer, it's my job to bridge that. Hey, I've got the solution. You've got a pain point. I can help you. Um, and so it's interesting to hear what the challenges are that different companies face. And do they actually need a fractional chief marketing officer and strategist? Or maybe do they just need a tactician, so to speak, someone who comes in and can do their graphic design, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's really fun. I love it every time. And every time it's it's something different. And I, I learn about companies I didn't even know existed. I'm like, wow, I didn't, I didn't even know this was a thing. So I think it's cool. I love it. It's pretty amazing. All the different types of companies that are out there, people who are, right. finding, you know, they're getting inspiration from wherever the heck they get it from, whether it's past careers or maybe they have a passion or, you know, a project they've been working on at home. And they're like, Oh, I'm going to turn this into a business. And I want to start doing this thing. It's, it's always a, like, cause I, as a business coach, I talk to a lot of different types of entrepreneurs as well. And I'm always like, this is so cool. Like you took this business from, you know, a, um, a vision and an idea. And all of a sudden, like you're actually putting your heart and soul behind it and you're actually putting yourself out there in a big way. Yeah. Oh gosh, darling, let me just tell you, this is an example I have. So I emceed an event last over this past summer. So it's a few months ago for a conference in the executive protection industry. This is a great example. I didn't even know executive protection was really a thing. I'd kind of heard about it. And then I got there and I was so wowed by it. Like we're talking about people who, who protected the president and they were in secret service and military and police, and they move out of that government space into the private world. And now they're doing that same kind of secret service, but executive protection for say high net worth individuals or celebrities, or even people who, don't fit in those categories, but for whatever need, you know, have, have to have that protection, but it's an entire industry that I didn't really know much about until I got to MC that event and met so many amazing people. So yes, yeah. I just love it. I love it. It's cool. It's like, you're like, you watch the movies and you're like, all right, there's FBI and secret service. And like, yeah. there's people protecting <laughs> us from aliens and there's all yeah. these different things. And then you're like, holy crap, there's actually like a whole yeah. industry of these people and they have an association and they get together. <laughs> Great. Right. Exactly. It was like, wonderful. It was like really the men in black. They exist. <laughs> <laughs> they all walked in their shades. Their sunglasses yep. on. I'm just kidding. They did not. And I'm sure they have all kinds of cool technology that we would love to get our hands on. Right. But yeah. <laughs> I think I'll just stick with the marketing communication side. I'll let them do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it it's, it's, Cool when we get a chance to like see like a peek into like the different types of businesses and the different types of th things that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit like what's like the day of the like the day a day in a life of Becky? Like what are some of the type of things that you're doing with your clients and how are you seeing like the biggest rewards like the ROI? Because sometimes as entrepreneurs we're a little bit hesitant to put money behind our marketing or to hire somebody in like you to come in and actually take over that piece because, you know, we want to, we either, we either have two concepts. We're like, we're going to DIY it and we're just going to have this small little business and I'm just going to do everything and, you know, I'll grow slowly, whatever. And then we also have the other side of people who are like, no, I want to like fill these positions with everybody on the org chart. And I just want my one little role. Like, how do you um, help support like those different pieces? You know, and you're right. I mean, you just kind of gave some high level examples of the gamut. You know, you've got all the different folks that are out there. Um, you know, I've talked to some folks who really did need a marketing strategist and they were, they had founded a company. And when they talked about during the discovery call what they needed, they absolutely needed a, a fractional CMO. But I could tell it wasn't going to happen because they just weren't ready in their mind, you know, and that's a big part of it. Like you said, they, you know, as an entrepreneur at the beginning, we all start out doing everything. We do the finance, we do the accounting, we do the, the marketing, you know, we, you know, all the things. Um, and so when you get to that point where you've grown and you've scaled and it's time to start maybe letting go of the kind of white knuckle grasp, that's a hard transition. And, you know, so like this one group I was thinking of, um, you know, they were like, they just wanted that tactician. We want, they want it. Like, I want someone to build my website. I want, I just want someone to do graphic design and, and that's great. And I think that's the route they ended up going. Um, but whether it's me or someone else, I think soon they're going to find it is time for that strategist because they were growing so fast. Um, and for them in particular, they had small children and they were constantly on the road and they were working, you know, 15 hour days sometimes. And, and I thought that's a great indicator of when you would start needing to kind of let go, you know, the white knuckle grasp and, and start doling out, 
you know, and, and designating jobs for other people so that you can actually run the company and run the business and not do the accounting and the finance and the marketing and, you know, all, all, all the things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different folks. And then I have other people who come to me right away and say, we need strategy. We're tired of throwing spaghetti at the wall. We get it. We know we're doing it. Um, and we want to stop. And so, um, then I'll help them with that. And, and, and really, honestly, my favorite, I don't know. Do I have a favorite, Darlene? I just, they're so, that my favorite is that they're all so different. That's actually truly my favorite part. But, you know, I came from broadcast journalism and there's not a lot of journalists who move into marketing per se. They do maybe in NPR or, you know, um, that earned media space, but not as much in um, marketing. And one of the things I've realized when I go in with clients or when I used to work for people in my W-2 life um, mm-hmm is brand voice. You walk in and they're like, oh, we don't, we don't have this messaging right. And we're not really connecting with the, 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 the people that we're meant to help. And I'll ask almost right off the bat, like, what's your brand voice? And, and honestly, I hear, I, I don't know what a brand voice is, or I kind of know what it is, but no, we don't have it. Oh gosh, that is, that is one of my favorite parts. And I wrote a book on it. That's why I wrote the book. It's titled brand voice, people plus data drive results. But the reason I did that it was so important for people to understand it's not just storytelling. Like people are like, Oh, that's nice. It's stories. And, you know, but I mean, I have, I have some case studies. I mean, we actually brand voice drives revenue. And if you think about it, your bottom line is not your numbers. Your bottom line are people because it's the people that make the decision to buy your product or service then the, then the numbers move, you know, they don't, they don't move on their own. So you have to be able to make that human connection to get that, that going. And, and I love that part. I love building that human connection. Yeah. I, I, I talk a lot in my business as well about your brand voice and your, your storytelling and how you're putting yourself out there with your messaging and your marketing, those different pieces. I'd love to hear like with your book, you say it's called brand voice. It is brand voice, people plus data drive results. But yes, brand voice is the main. Okay. And that, like, tell us a little bit about your like methodology or your framework that you use with it. Yeah. So, you know, and what I, I did in the book too, I kind of gave people a cheat sheet because as I was writing it, I was like, I kept coming up with ideas. So like off to the side, I started writing like almost like a framework, like, hey, if you're in this industry, these are the things you could do in this industry. Here's another idea. And then I, I tacked that on at the end of the book so people can can look at it for their their area. But you know, what you do when it comes to building your brand voice is making sure that it's not just, oh, I have a fun story, but they're evidence-based stories. They're fact-based stories, which is very much a part of my journalistic background. You don't just tell a story because it's a good story to tell. Don't get me wrong. Fiction has a wonderful place in this world. Yeah. But for this, it's nonfiction, but nonfiction doesn't have to be dry. It doesn't have to be boring. And honestly, even if you're a numbers person, you probably, w- you're still human. You still like that story aspect. So, um, a lot of times what we'll do with a brand voice is we'll tell, um, a a company and, and I say a lot of times, because sometimes they don't have as many people on their team, but if it's a bigger one, we'll say, come up with a good cross section of people, whether we are talking about a newly hired or that person who's ready to get the gold watch after 40 years or whatever it might be, um, you know, gender, ethnicity differences, um, departmental differences, finance and accounting or marketing or risk management, you know, so everyone kind of comes to the table and a great example um, of come to the table with that diversity of thought, but also ask those people to come with some data points. And that sometimes I think scares people. I think they're like, oh, data, you know, I don't, I don't have data or I'm not a data analyst. It's not, you don't have to have a, you know, a master's degree in this. You don't have to have any degree in it. Um, just come with a data point. And here's a great example. We spoke when we were working on a brand voice for a financial institution I worked at, we had a loan officer who came and spoke. Um, we were talking and she said, you know, have a data point. It's really small. This is, this is kind of an example of like, there are no dumb questions. This is a great example of there are no small data points and it's all data, not just big data. And um, it was a thousand dollar loan. And I mean, we're talking about a $650, $700 million in asset size financial institution. So of course you're not going to, you'd glaze right, you'd zing right past that thousand dollar, you know, yeah. on the Excel sheet. Well, the story behind that data point was that she, um, cause she had that, she's a front office. So she talks directly to the customers and that was her story with the data point. Um, it was someone who needed a wheelchair ramp to get into their home because their family member, I think it was the mother, I, I believe, um, 
and could no longer get into her own home. And they had a lower socioeconomic um, situation. They didn't have a lot of income. And if they did a credit card, the compound interest was going to, would sink them because they were only be able to pay a little bit off at a time. So they got a loan for a thousand dollars, which isn't what most people would do. A lot of people would just throw it on their credit card and, and pay it later. Um, and it really opened the conversation to the people at that financial institution and who are we serving and how do we reach those people? Yes, we have high income individuals, but we had a significant amount of lower income um, folks that fit in that bucket that we needed to reach and we needed to help. And it really helped inform our brand voice and our story and how do we reach how do we put a message to someone who has maybe is older, more established in their life and has a good chunk of change or someone who's just younger and just starting out? And, and how do you connect to both of them? And so we had a really fun brand voice session with that. One. Sounds like it. And it, it's cool when you're able to like find like the, the, the different angles to get in to really call in the right types of people that you're trying to work with and you know, and that story like speaks to the heart, right? Like if you have a family member who, you know, might need extra accessibility support or friends or people that like, pe like it pops into your mind and you're like, oh, I have a connection point here. I want to like lean in. I want to hear more about what you're saying. Like right. tell me more, Becky, this is awesome. And that's right. what we want to do when it comes to storytelling, because yeah, like you said, we can tell stories just to tell a story. We see it all the time on social media, right? Like yeah. people are just telling stories and there's not always like a through line or a purpose. And especially if we're growing a business and we're trying to attract the right people into us and we want to work with amazing people and make that impact and be part of the legacy. We want to share some story. We want to like engage with them and feel that connection and build, you know, we all hear the no like, and trust factor. Like we, like we've heard it a million times, but how do we do it? How do we get those people in? And I was just talking with a client last week and I was like, sometimes story is like one sentence. I think we overthink yeah. storytelling. Like we think, oh, we have to get up on a stage and tell the whole entire, every detail of every part of what happened. But, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, I was out for a walk last night and then mm -hmm. like take it into wherever it needs to go. What yeah. are some of like the little what are your favorite like little tips when it comes to sharing story that kind of always grab people, especially when they're struggling? Because I know a lot of my audience might be struggling. Like it feels hard to tell a story in the beginning and until you kind of get in there, what, what are some things you would recommend? I think, especially when you're younger, so then you may not are younger in your business. That is, um, you know, you may not have that team of people to call, you know, to call into the, you know, to the boardroom or to whatever meeting room you're in and say, bring your data and let's get a good group think going, you know, or get, just kind of get that diversity of thought. Um, but that's when you really, I think, have to be really honest with yourself and look at, you still have data points. So if you're on social media, look on your Facebook page, look on your LinkedIn page, look in, you know, it, it, they, it, those platforms give you on the back end, as you know, information on your demographics, where are most of your likes and engagement coming from. Um, that will give you, that'll start to open that door for you as to who you're actually talking to. And honestly, more importantly, who's listening, you could talk to whoever you want to talk to, but if they're not listening, you need to pay attention to that. Um, and then you have to decide, is there a nuance to this? It may not be a full on pivot, but it may be a nuance like, oh, I thought I was really reaching X, but it seems like I have a really good stronghold on Y and maybe I need to head down that path. Um, but it's not always that simple. You got to look into it a little bit more, but it also can be that simple. You know, when you're a solopreneur, you don't have to make a mountain out of a molehill. Just start with the small pieces of data you have. And, and the other thing is, I think, to be open to feedback. You know, I mean, ask people, ask your friends, ask your family, ask a few clients for testimonials, find out what they're saying about you and be like, you know, I, I had a testimonial that I already knew what I did, but it made me realize I needed to push it out a little more where she said, you know, I kind of thought that you were going to come in and give us like a nice pamphlet or a nice pretty brochure. And I had no idea that you were going to uncover discrepancies in our sales process and help us with our operational deficiencies. Because when you start doing marketing, there's such a Venn diagram with every team that you really started to open up all these other um, processes that we needed to fix. And I knew I did that, but it was interesting to hear her say, well, I thought you were just going to come in with a pretty brochure. And I really thought that was kind of a thing of the past, but it's cl clearly still very relevant. I think it's a, an uphill battle for marketers, but I don't know if it's an uphill battle. It's just an educational battle that it's, it's not just about logos and, and brand colors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's so much more behind it, like getting into like that 
deep connection with them and making them feel seen and heard and valued in those different moments. Right. Right, exactly. And, and and all of those things fall into your brand voice. You know, I mean, look at your sales cycle and you're saying, hey, we're exped- you know, we're going to expedite this and we do that. And then you look at your sales process and you start tracking the data. That's the other thing. Once you have your brand voice and you're moving forward, you want to continually don't ever stop tracking that data. And that same client, um, I can't remember at the beginning what she had told me their sales cycle was off the top of my head. But long story short, what we uncovered was by the time someone went, When someone first came into the funnel by submitting a form on their website to at one point we were talking and it was like, gosh, April or so. There were people there, darling, that had moved into our funnel by submitting a form in February. They had been sitting there, not converted. They weren't a yes and they weren't a no. And I'm like, okay, this needs to tighten up. (laughs) Like we need to talk to the sales team and figure out what, you know, what the what the situation is. So again, there's a lot of things that your data will tell you to inform your brand voice and then continue on that track. So you don't want to stop tracking it. Yeah. I think you just hit on like something that's really important is we think, oh, as soon as somebody comes and they come have a, you know, a strategy or discovery call with us, or they find our website, or they happen to meet us in an event, we, we think, oh, well, they're, they're going to convert immediately to a client. And we've all had clients that, you know, we meet them and they turn into a client immediately. We've also had the ones where, we met them six years ago and they come around, they're like, Hey, I'm ready to work with you. Like I'm ready. Like I've been watching what you've been doing for six years. This happened to me about two years ago. I was, and I was like, how did you even find me? And he's like, I've been following you for six years. And I was like, wow, like (laughs) that was a longer, like, like lead time. But I think it goes into the nurture piece. How do we nurture the people that are in our sphere of influence? Because not everybody's going to buy right this minute. We don't, might not need it right this moment. We might not think we need it. We don't have, you know, we don't want to invest in ourselves at that moment. Maybe we don't have the confidence in ourselves in that moment. So we're, you know, building that muscle so that when we're ready, we know exactly who we can go to. Yeah. What are what are some things that you like to say to your clients? Like when they're like, how, how do you help them stay in that nurture cycle so they don't stop showing up? Because I think the biggest mistake I've seen is entrepreneurs will stop marketing right before Mm -hmm. somebody was about to say yes. Like they don't see, like, it's like that top of mind, you say top of mind, you say top of mind. And then all of a sudden, like you stop. And then that person's like, oh, I need that thing. Who was that person that I was seeing? Oh, I forgot. But now I just found, you know, so-and-so just, I'm going to go give them my money, even though I've been nurtured for, you know, six years by somebody else. How do you, how do you, what is, what's your thoughts on like dancing in that space? You know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that I say, actually, there's three key elements to a a successful brand voice, and it is to build a genuine, a simple and a consistent brand voice. Um, And I, you know, I distill it down to those three words, but there's a lot to unpack behind each one. Um, And in the book, I talk about each one individually, but, you know, the genuine comes from your data, uh, um, making sure that it is evidence-based because then it's genuine. You're not making it up. It's truly the data points of who you're talking to when you looked at the Facebook data and the LinkedIn data. Um, and you know, what you're saying, is it resonating with the people you thought it would resonate? If not, like, it's just, you just really dig into that so that you can finally really realize that connection, like what I'm saying and who I'm connecting to, what, who are they? What am I saying? What is it that they like? Quantitative and qualitative data, both don't just do numbers. That's where that, like, loan officer is a great example. She had the quantitative data of the thousand dollar loan, but then she had the qualitative data of the story. You know, if you're able to get send out surveys to your, to your um, customers, your membership, whoever it would be, um, and get that qualitative side to it because data numbers alone are not, they're not the only data piece. So that really helps build that genuine part of it. But then you also want it to be simple. I, there are so many quotes out there and I'll slaughter any of them. So I won't even go down that path. I have them written in my book, but I, I'm so bad at like off the cuff quoting metaphors, all that. Um, but it's just the idea of how the the smartest people, the most intelligent people you've ever met are really the ones who can tell a very simple and concise sentence of what they do or whatever the message is that they're trying to relay. Um, and the more simplistic it is, the easier you're going to um, have of a time of reaching your target audience. We are all so busy. We have such stretched bandwidth. Don't make it any more difficult. You know, like I've been at companies and they're like, oh my gosh, we just talked to this customer and they thought blah, blah, blah about us. And I said, okay, well, instead of eye rolling at them, we should be eye rolling at us. If they thought that that's on us, they don't 
care if they got it right or not. They'll just, to your point, nurtured by us for the last six years and then go find someone else to actually convert with. Um, you know, those are things to listen to. Like, okay, they didn't quite get the mark. Like the game of telephone. Remember that game? Do you ever do that yeah. when you were? Um, I just remember like in third grade, our teacher saying at the very front right desk, hey, you know, whisper, whisper. And then it went through all the, all the rows. And then at the end, it came out something totally different. Um, but that's the idea. Your brand is not, it's your brand, but you're not the only one telling it. So you need to make sure it's consistent. And that's the third thing. It needs to be simple. So it, it, it's easier to be consistent. And so at the end of the day, people are saying the same thing that you're saying. Um, you also want to be consistent. So when you're onboarding a new hire, or you're telling a customer on a billboard, blasting a message that they both feel the same because you don't want that person to drive down the road and see this really fun billboard. And then when they come in and they get onboarded, it's this really stuffy, serious feel. They're like, wait a minute, this doesn't, this doesn't jive because yeah. then guess what happens? You lose trust. And it goes right back to what you said, which is people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And at the end of the day, you could cut it off. People do business with people. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's the key. So, um, that simple and consistent areas and inconsistency, not just in saying the same story, but to your point, staying relevant on, for example, a social media platform. If you're posting, keep it consistent. Don't post. And then all of a sudden ghost your audience for five months and there's nothing on there because they'll go to LinkedIn and they'll see last post five months ago and they'll, then they move on. And that might've been your one chance. So, be realistic about your bandwidth and post, for example, on social media or send out your newsletter or your email campaigns, whatever it is, in a consistent cadence. Like know when you're ready to scale up to that next level. Don't say, I'm going to post on LinkedIn five times a day. I mean, five times a week. And then you get burned out and all of a sudden you, you go five months. Yeah. That's not great. <laughs> And that's why I tell all my clients, I'm like, find a consistency that works for you, that excites you and lights you up. Because if, if it's once a month, great. If it's twice a month, great. If it's one time a week, awesome. Like, but <laughs> find what's going to work for you. Because like, like you were just saying, like the, the worst thing we can do is people see us, they think they are like paying attention. Then all of a sudden they're like, you're out of sight, out of mind, out of nowhere. And then right. it's, it, we're, it's easy to forget. We're messaged to and marketed to. I forget the stats these days. I think it used to be 3000. I'm pretty sure I feel like it's like 6,000 or higher at this point. Like we're seeing some kind of ad or advertisement, or we're reading something on social platforms and we just have so much distractions. Yes. And, so like half the time I'm like, was that today or yesterday? And it could have been something I did two seconds ago because right, I, I might've done 30 things in the meantime in between. And I'm like, time gets um, kind of out of alignment. And we, if we don't see it and we lose that, like it can make a big difference when it comes to, you know, our buying decisions and getting people to pay yeah. attention to what we're doing. And it's no, it's a noisy out there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I, I, um, I think about that long game all the time. I mean, my gosh, darling, there are so many people that I have helped and whether it was as an entrepreneur now or just over my life that have circled back around from who knows when that are, you know, Hey, I needed to help with whatever. And I saw that you did this thing and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, like, you know, but, but they remembered it because you stayed relevant. They, you stayed in front of them and not in an obnoxious way. Again, it's a relationship building process. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's always fun when like somebody that you haven't seen for a while, like swings back into your sphere of oh, influence yeah. and they, they're like, oh my gosh, you're exactly what I needed. I had um, somebody who I networked with in a totally different way, um, probably 10, 13 years ago, recently signed up as a client with me. And it was, you know, she, we already had the know, like, and trust. She already knew me. She liked me. She trusted me. She didn't know what type of work I had done because we were working together in a totally different context prior, uh, like volunteer type stuff. And we just never explored that side of things as often. And she was like, okay, let's do it. Like, I'm ready to work with you. And it was, you know, a deep relationship that, you know, had, it had been years since we had nurtured it, but it was still there because of that ability. So I think it's important, like when we think about those like relationships, how do we make those roots deep as quick as possible? Mm -hmm. You can still be a social butterfly. You can still know lots of people and like connect with lots of people, but making sure like, how do you tether them a little bit to where they remember you? I remember when I first started my business 18 years ago, um, I, 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 
And I laugh now when I think back because I just wanted to meet everybody. I'm like, if everybody knows my name, I can be like Norm from Cheers. <laughs> and like, I'll walk into a networking meeting and they're going to be there, Starlene, the business coach. We, she knows exactly how to help support you with, you know, getting consistent income with your clients, like go see her. And so I thought like I was social butterflying. I thought everybody, everybody knew me, but what I realized quickly was I was never building a little bit of that root tethering down. They knew who I was. They didn't quite know how to send business. They weren't sure how to refer business over to me. So it was disservicing because I was so busy trying to meet everybody. I never actually stuck around. It was like, Becky, let's have a conversation. Let's get to know each other. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, hi, Becky. I'm Darlene. It's great to meet you. Like, let me connect you, Becky, with um, Susie over here, because I think you guys could do great things together. And you're like, that's awesome. Darlene's so great. She's great at connecting everybody. But you're like, what the heck does Darlene even do? Like, is she an, an, an event coordinator around here? Like a networking goddess? Like, what's happening? <laughs> That is, that is so true. I'm in a couple, and I'm sure you are too, you know, entrepreneurship groups and networking groups. And that's one of the biggest takeaways I've been getting over this last year is to be very intentional and deliberate with the people that you're talking to. And I would tell you, I did that same thing this past. So I'm one year into my entrepreneurial side of my career. And I would say it's just in the last couple months that I've started to realize how important it is. And I like how you talk about kind of tethering and kind of growing some roots. It's a great way to put it um, because I, you know, I was meeting everybody, talking to everybody. And then I, I felt overwhelmed. Like, how do I track these hundreds of people that I've talked to and remember what each one does? And I mean, much less than remember me. Yeah. Um, and then you get down on yourself. I think you're like, oh God. I knew I talked to someone about that thing and what was it and how, how could I have forgotten, you know? And then, well, how you forgot is because you're meeting a hundred people a day and you need to slow your roll <laughs> and just be more intentional. And to your point, kind of go a little bit deeper as yeah. opposed to the breath. It changes so much. Like when you actually have a deeper conversation, you're like, you actually can remember like, oh yeah, I spoke to Becky and she shared these things with me today versus going, I met somebody and now I got 30 business cards and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm actually glad. I'm so happy we had this conversation because I am going to be talking in September to a group of women in technology and they wanted me to talk to them very specifically about brand, but the kind of customize it to a concern they all have, which is they said a lot of the people in their group are introverts and they know that networking is necessary, but to them, it's definitely a necessary evil. And how do you do the thing? And, and that was one of the things I was going to say is, you know, some people go into an event and are like, I'm not leaving until I have 15 business cards or however, whatever the number is. Mm -hmm. um, but is that the right way? And it could be, I mean, for everybody it's different, but for an introvert, I definitely don't think it is. Oh, that no. sounds painful. Um, They'd but, never you know, leave. They'd be under the table when the party's <laughs> over and like the cleaning crew would come in and they'd be like, who's under the table? Why <laughs> I can't leave. I don't have my 15. Where, right. Cards. Where the extrovert would probably go in with 15 in the mind and they'd have a hundred best new, new best friends. <laughs> right. And so it's quantity versus quality. I mean, and if you can do quantity and quality to an extent, you can, there's definitely a, a tipping point where it just becomes quantity and it's just overwhelming. Um, but it's just a good point and, and something that I wanted to bring up with them. And again, I just like that kind of, hey, maybe quality is important. Get the roots tethered out a little bit. Yeah. Not just with one though. That's their other thing. They're like, then when we find someone, then we just stay. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that either. Because they're probably like, oh my gosh, Darlene is still talking to me. <laughs> I need to go network. Yeah. You're like, I need to go talk to somebody else. I made one yes. good, one new best friend, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> who else am I? And that, and that can be challenging, right? Like how do we, that's why, and I think that's where in the beginning I was so good at like connecting people. I just didn't stick around long enough to like, uh, like I learned to like have a conversation, not for an hour, not, you know, not for 13 seconds, but like, you know, two to 10 minutes somewhere in there and really like deepen that relationship. And then when I left that conversation, I could be like, I have a genuine, a genuine way I can follow back up with Becky and continue this conversation. And maybe we get together for a coffee chat and we, you know, we get to know each other better. And then I say, oh, you know what? We actually work with similar people. Like we can refer speaking opportunities back and forth. Like, right. you know, example for us, like you just mentioned that you're going to be speaking in an event soon. I, I love to speak. That's my, one of my favorite marketing strategies is getting up on a stage to connect, connect, but I can find that connection and be like, Ooh, like me and Becky can share this type of conversation now because we're both doing the same thing. And now I know how to follow up. I know how to stay in touch. 
I can be like, hey, Becky, I found a speaking opportunity. They're looking for somebody who does what you do. Or, hey, I just spoke here. They're looking for somebody different now. Let's bring you in. And we can continue those yeah. conversations. And that's when, like, that's when the roots really settle in. And you mm-hmm. can actually, like, sustain your business growth. And you can sustain those relationships. Because connection and relationships are probably the biggest part about entrepreneurship. It's all about who you know and how you're building those relationships. And we forget sometimes it's not, it doesn't have to be a numbers game. I I, I hate, like people used to say, like when I first started my business, I didn't stay very long with the franchise that I purchased because it was very like, go get 10 no's, go get a hundred no's. Someone's bound to say yes. And I'm like, I don't want to like set my mindset on, I'm going to go get 10 no's today. Like that doesn't work for me. It might work for some people and have at it like but that feels like a very more masculine type of marketing strategy where I need relationships and connection and I want to you know I don't like to be told 10 times or 100 times no like I would I'd like better odds (laughs) I was born and raised in Vegas I'm like (laughs) my my gambling statistics have to be better than that (laughs) but I think it's important like that we just look at those pieces and like notice for ourselves like how can we show up in these moments how can Mm -hmm. we build the right types of connections and how do we, you know, message in a way that grabs people's attention and makes them go, I do want to follow up with this person. I want to hear more about what you do so that you can, you know, have the right conversations with the right people. Cause we've all been verbally vomited on at a networking mm-hmm. event where it's like you said, like your new sidekick won't leave your side and they've told you everything about them and they haven't maybe even asked one thing about you. <laughs> right. And that's a good point for an introvert too. If you don't like talking, that's a great opportunity. Come with a few good open-ended questions and let them do the talking. You know what I mean? If, if it pains you to have to talk, still talk, but that's another strategy. Go, you, you know. Bring your and, wing woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, and for an extrovert like myself, it's also a good strategy to reel me in. Like, okay, you're not allowed to start talking until you ask these three questions. You know what I mean? Or whatever they are. Um, and again, make sure they're good, open-ended questions. And, you know, there's always the, and then what, you know, those type ideas or, you know, what now, like, you know, kind of like the child when the, why is the sky blue? Well, why, well, why, 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 you know, but there's a point to that, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lesson to be learned from that very, um, childish way of explaining it, but, you know, someone answers, uh, answers your question, dig a little deeper, find out a little bit more behind that. And then when they answer it, there's probably been a little bit more behind that. And you can really get to know someone that way with those seven layers, you know? Yeah. You got, you got to keep like pulling back the layers of the onion. <laughs> yes, exactly. Keep getting exactly. deeper in here. I'm curious um, with the work that you're doing. And plus I ask this question to almost every entrepreneur who's on my show anyways, but like, what are you seeing as the best marketing strategies that are working for you specifically in this market space right now? Like what's, what do you see is really working? Not that it's going to work for everybody. So everybody take this as a lens that it may or may not work for you, but Becky, like what's working for you when it comes to marketing these days? For me, it's relationships. It kind of goes back to everything we've been talking about. Um, I think when you, what I have found are the people that I do spend a little more time with um, and that I do kind of grow a a little few, you know, a few roots with, um, they tend to either um, come back as a client or or convert to a client soon after if if there's not a long history with them. Um, And also they're good referral partners, Um, you know, networking with too many people. And that really is an area that I'm at right now that I'm starting to, to, to turn that ship to becoming more deliberate with who I am having my meetings with and to have consistent meetings with a few people opposed to one-off meetings with hundreds. Um, and that really seems to be what's working for me and in the networking groups and and, in entrepreneurial groups and and fractional C-suite groups that I'm in every single one of them always say, Everywhere from, well, actually all up to hundred percent, but a lot of them were like 75 was on the way low end, mainly upper nineties, 99% of their business comes from referrals. Every one of them have said that. So, um, you know, a lot of people, like you said, you've been doing it for 18 years. I've been doing it for one, you know? So when I hear someone who's been doing it for a lot longer, I pay attention, uh, you know, I, I hang on a lot of, maybe hang a little too much, but I hang on every word they said, cause I want to hear why you know, why it worked for them? How did it work for them? What it was that they did? And again and again, it keeps coming back, referral partners and and, and talking to people and building relationships. Um, 
you know, I spoke at an event not too long ago and it wasn't somebody that I have a long history with, but just that opportunity to get in front of a crowd and to talk and to have them. I've actually made one conversion that way and I'm working on a second potential conversion of a, of a client that way. Um, both of whom I um, met because I was up on stage and I knew the importance of building that trust even from up there, you know, not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but when you're out there and you're doing your speaking engagements, I really do love what I do and I'm just so passionate about it. And I know I can help so many people. And I think that just comes across on stage and it comes across when I talk to people one-on-one -on -one. and accordingly, that's the area I'm trying to stay in. I think some people maybe don't have as passionate of a, vo a voice or a tone or, or it doesn't mean they're not. They just maybe don't come across that way. Yeah. Um, and for those folks, I, I, you know, a lot of people say cold email works. Cold email has not helped, um, you know, me, but, I, but again, I'm not, a, I'm not a group. I'm not an organization. I'm me, Becky Freemall. And so for my job and for my, my business, it's better, I think, to, to make those relationships. So absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent agree with you. And I get so many cold pitches every single day, and I'm like, does I'm like who is this working for? Because I never buy from a cold pitch. <laughs> Can I tell you? So I have actually. Now I didn't necessarily. Well, I guess I did buy. I um I bit so to speak in a DM I got in LinkedIn. Uh, just someone reaching out. Hey, I do tech work. Blah blah blah. Um, and I would just have it's timing. Timing is everything, and and yeah. everything not just for entrepreneurship in every aspect. Um, he's my tech guy now, like when I need, you know, technology type, you know, back end of a website, helping set up an email, like the technical side of the email campaign, um, he's doing it, you know? And so it does work. And here's a fun little tidbit. If you look, I have like a ratio sheet that I put together for clients, um, cold email, believe it or not, is still the highest ROI for every dollar spent in cold email, you can get anywhere from 30. There's some research stats out there that go all the way up to $40 in return. There is nothing out there that is a one to 40 ratio, but not even close. Um, but for what I do and for me, Becky Freemall, that is not exactly what works for me. So just because the ratio is good, don't get so hung up like, oh gosh, but it's such a good ROI. Cause I did that. And I'm like, it's working for everyone else. You know, I'm like, well, okay, it's not really working for everyone else. It works well, for the right people. What what has popped in my head when you were saying that was it's like, okay, I nurtured somebody for six years and then I fall off and then somebody just randomly pops up. Like I feel like there's that piece to cold email right. that mm -hmm. is like you said, it's the timing piece. And yeah. if it's just right, it's gonna be beautiful. Like if I just happen to get an email from somebody for tech and my computer keeps crashing. Like, I'm like, I'm going to be able to put some dots together really quickly. And I might be like, oh, I met somebody else at a networking event, forgot who they were. I haven't heard from them in a while. So you fell in my lap right at the perfect timing. Yeah. Like there's that, no. but, but man, yeah. it's, it's hard to do that cold email. <laughs> it is. And sorry, I, I just was like, got excited about something else, which was the other thing to keep in mind with email is like 25% of the business or um, it was somewhere along that stat this is the long tail game. You know, when you're talking about email, a lot of sales are made in the long tail of the email. And, you know, when you talk about the bell curve and the, the tail goes way out at the end, that's where, you know, the bell curve might be when you're sending the emails, but then it kind of bottoms out and then you just have this tail that just kind of flat lines. A lot of business is done then, you know, and, and it's done because it's a consistent email campaign. It's not a one and done. Yes. You're sending them. And you also want to be a thought leader. Don't just email people and be like, look at me, hire me, look at me, hire me. You want to, you know, you want to email Have them and some say, value. <laughs> yes, value to their day and, and be a thought leader and give some advice. You know, it, it people appreciate that. That one of the things I was told when I first started my business was to do cold outreach. And it wasn't a lot, it wasn't in huge alignment with who I am, like walking into a storefront and starting a conversation just felt like totally out of my element. Like I came from retail management. I was used to customers walking in and I could service and help support, like give them whatever they needed, but I never had to go get a client, right? Like the clients right. came to me. And so there was that like mental shift of switching that piece. And it, it took a lot of finessing and figuring out what was going to work. But I was told, I was told to like, take like a mannequin right arm and mail it to the client that I really wanted and be like, I give my right arm for a, a conversation with you. And I'm like, that is some hard, cold, car, hard, cold, <laughs> hardcore 
cold marketing, if I can say that, that is a hundred percent out of alignment with what I'm going to do and how I'm going to show up. Like if that works for you, like all the power to you, somebody steal this idea and go try it and let me know how it goes. But that's creative. Yeah. I mean, it's, but, it's catchy yeah. and it's going to grab some attention. I never tried it. So I don't actually know that it would work. I don't even know how much a arm ma- an arm for a mannequin would cost, <laughs> like the marketing dollar either. acquisition part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm singing, by the way, the second you told that story, I was singing in my head, desperado. <laughs> <laughs> Just think if someone was like, I get my right arm. I'd be like, Ooh, you really need some business. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but it might work. Who knows? You're stretching. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it probably would work, depending on the industry and depending on the person. And like, if that's, if that's you go for it. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah, as I say, you do you. <laughs> yeah. Becky, this has been so fun having you on the conversation. I'm so glad I got to celebrate my 100th episode with you. Um, I know. I'm going to another day celebrate. <laughs> before we wrap up, I have a couple rapid fire questions for you just so we can get to know Becky a little bit more. What is your happy spot when you need to reflect, recharge, and rejuvenate? Like, what do you like to do? Where do you like to go? I like to be with, I like to be with people. That is what recharges me. I love being with, with my tight, you know, my family and my friends. Yeah. A hundred percent. Awesome. What book is on your nightstand right now? Or what are you learning or how are you growing? Uh, so legit brand voice. <laughs> it's on my you got your own book on your nightstand. I love it. <laughs> yes. It's my own book. Um, but it is actually sitting there. Obviously I'm not reading it, but I do actually pick it up from time to time to come up with, um, like little short snippets I can put on social media from it. So, um, how horrible is that? My own book brand voice. <laughs> all right. Uh, I learn from myself all the time. I'll go back and read an old blog post or I'll pull up something or I'll listen to an old podcast. Sometimes like something will pop in my mind and I'll turn it on. And I'm like, oh, I said that. That was good. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pretty smart. (laughs) I should use that. (laughs) That's awesome. I'll take my own advice. (laughs) It's, It's one of those, one of those things, right? Like we can read a book you know, five times. And every time we read it, we're going to learn something new. We're going to see it through a different set of eyes. We, we've grown, we've developed, we've changed. And so I think we, there's always something to, to learn, even if it's from our own amazing selves. Yes. <laughs> if I could buy you a plane ticket and send you anywhere in the world today, where would you go and why? Hmm. I'm not going to lie. I heard this. I've listened to your podcast and I've heard this question. And then I kind of forgot that you were going to ask it. Um, on earth, I would say Africa. I've always wanted to go to Africa, but um, if there was no like criteria to it, I'd probably do a time machine and um, maybe go back in time to meet some really cool people. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. Let's go back in time. There, there's so anything many forward. I just would love to do that. I think it'd be neat. Yeah. <laughs> If we had a superpower. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather go back though. I don't know if I want to know what the future is. Cause you know, sometimes there are things you don't want to know, get too anxiety ridden. I'd rather just leave the future unknown, but I'd like to go back. <laughs> there, there'd be some cool moments. I'm sure that you could experience. Yeah. Oh yeah. And legacy is huge um, to most people. What's one of the, what's one of the pieces you want to leave as part of your legacy in this world? You know, that one is kind of easy for me. I want people to think that I, I I made them feel like they belonged and that they were seen and they were heard. Mm. I love that. Yeah. Seen and heard. I love that so much. Becky, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was an absolute joy to celebrate a hundred episodes. Thank you for <laughs> being here. Um, if you are brand new to the, to the podcast, please hit subscribe send us a message, send Becky a message, send me a message. Let us know what you thought of today's conversation. Um, Becky, I know people are going to want to connect with you. Where do they find you? Absolutely. So you can go to my website, um, beckyfreemall.com. Um, I also have a free gift if people want to start building their own brand voice. Um, I have a kind of a how-to strategy session at a high level. Um, and that's just beckyfreemall.com forward slash free gift. Um, and then you can also find me on LinkedIn. I, um, my LinkedIn is just forward slash Becky Freemall. My Facebook is the same thing. Facebook.com forward slash Becky Freemall, all Becky Freemall. So mm-hmm. you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn. Those are the two I use the most. My Twitter account got hacked. Oh, so frustrating. I don't so, think Twitter is a thing anymore anyways. <laughs> I, I, that's one of the reasons I've kind of let it go. I'm not trying too hard anyway. I was just like, Meh. so yeah. So you can find LinkedIn is where I'm the most active. Awesome. I will make sure all of those are in the show notes down below. So connect with Becky, go buy her book, 
Um, keep keep sharing stories, keep telling people who you are, keep putting yourself out there, be consistent and build some roots. And um, that's a wrap for another episode of the Attract and Stand Out podcast. As always, I believe in you. You're allowed to stand out. You're allowed to shine. You're allowed to be you. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.